The derivative gives us a pretty straightforward way to find where a function reaches its maximum or minimum. But let's face it, in the real world, the function you need to optimize is almost never just handed to you on a silver platter. You need to find it yourself, and that requires some more thinking. We've now seen how calculus lets us find where a function attains its local maximum or minimum value. Look for where the derivative is zero or undefined, and then check whether you have a maximum or a minimum by using either the first or second derivative test. This is useful when you already have the function you want to optimize. But what goes into the process of actually finding that function in the first place? This is where we start getting into the process of modeling. Choosing what quantities are relevant to your problem and figuring out how they're related to each other so that you can apply your mathematical tools and then solve the problem. We're going to take a look at what this process might entail from beginning to end. And I'm going to try myself to model what it might be like to think through those things, including some snags you might run into along the way and how to deal with them. According to theworldcounts.com, we use about 180 billion aluminum cans every year for soda and other drinks. That comes out to about 6,700 cans per second. And when you think about that, you can imagine that takes a lot of energy to produce all those cans. So being the environmentally friendly consumer that I'm sure you are, you might be wondering, is there any way we could save some of that energy and perhaps use less aluminum to manufacture our soda cans? I mean, we could use calculus to find a minimum of some kind, but where do we even begin? Well, first of all, we need to make some assumptions about the problem. Soda cans are roughly cylindrical, so for the sake of simplicity, we'll assume that the can is in the shape of a perfect circular cylinder. Now, in reality, the shape is a bit more complicated, like it's smaller at the top and bottom, and there's the tab, but like, like with the baseball problem from last lesson, we can always tweak our model later to account for this. And remember, we're all visual learners, among other kinds of learning, so it always helps to have a diagram whenever possible. We can label our diagram with the important measurements, namely the radius r and the height h. It helps to assign a variable to each of these as we go along. We'll also assume that we want our can to hold a typical 12 ounces of soda. And since one ounce is about 1.80469 cubic inches, we have about 21.65628 cubic inches for our volume. But writing that long decimal out every single time is going to get really annoying. So we'll just write V whenever we need to refer to that volume. Okay, looks good. Now, what's the thing we want to optimize here? Well, we want to minimize the surface area of our cylinder, since that's how much material it takes to make the can. So we can think of the can as being made of two circles on the top and bottom, each of which has an area of pi r squared, and then a rectangle that's been wrapped in a circle to make the side of the can, for which the area is the circumference 2 pi r times the height h of the can. So the surface area of our can is 2 times pi r squared plus 2 pi r times h, two circular bases plus a rectangle wrapped around them to make the side. That's the function we want to minimize. Now we just take the derivative. The derivative of 2 pi r squared is 4 pi r by the power rule, and the derivative of 2 pi r h is, um, uh-oh, we've run into a problem here. We've got too many variables. Both the height and the radius matter here. If we change one of those, we automatically change the other one. So we have to take both variables into account. But there's a trick we can use to deal with this. Remember that the volume of our can is the area of the base, pi r squared, times the height, h. We already know what the volume of the can is. That's a constant for our problem. So we could actually solve for the height h in terms of the other variables. We'd get h equals v over pi r squared. 
Then we can go back to our surface area and replace h with this expression, substitute it. So now that gives 2 times pi r squared plus 2 pi r times v over pi r squared. Clean that up a bit and we get the surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 2 v over r. And would you look at that? Now we only have one variable to deal with, namely the radius. Remember, the volume is a constant for our problem, not a variable, just because it uses a letter. Substitution is one of the most useful tricks in all of mathematics. Replace one thing with another thing that's equivalent to it, and you can often make your problem easier. Okay, now let's take the derivative. We'll rewrite that 2v over r as 2v times r to the negative 1. So now using the power rule, we get 4 pi r minus 2v r to the negative 2 for the derivative of s. Great. So now to find where the surface area is a minimum, we'll need to look at critical values. This is where it's actually useful to simplify our expression a bit. It'll make our job a lot easier. Using some algebra, which you should work through and double check on your own, we get that s prime equals 4 pi r cubed minus 2v all over r squared. Now, the critical values of the surface area are where this derivative here is zero or undefined. If the denominator is zero, then the derivative is certainly undefined. But if you think about it, that would mean the radius of the can is zero, which means we really wouldn't have much of a can at all. So we can probably safely ignore this as a possibility. But if the numerator is zero, then the whole derivative is zero. So if we solve for r here, we get the cube root of v over 2 pi. That's our critical value. And interestingly enough, if we plug that back in to find the height, and you should take a bit to work through the algebra and check, then we get that the height should be exactly double the radius, that is, equal to the diameter. But wait a minute, we do have to check, is that value of r a maximizer or a minimizer? Well, if we take the second derivative of surface area, we get 4 pi plus 4 v r to the negative 3. Plugging in cube root of v over 2 pi for r, we end up getting s double prime equals 12 pi. Again, take a moment to work this out for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Okay, 12 pi. So what? Well, 12 pi is positive. Since the second derivative is positive at our critical value, that means the graph of surface area should be concave up and that means r is a minimizer. That is, our surface area is at a local minimum. That's the second derivative test in action. Remembering that v equals about 21.65628 cubic inches and plugging that in, we get a radius of about 1.51 inches for the can. That gives us a height of about 3.02 inches, exactly double that, and a surface area of about 43.01 square inches. That would be the minimum possible surface area of a 12 ounce soda can. And it looks like this. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever seen a soda can that looks like that. Seems a little chunky. What gives? So it turns out there's other factors soda companies take into consideration when making cans, such as making sure you can hold it in one hand, especially if you're a child. Make of that what you will. Anyway, suppose a soda company does a study and decides the circumference of a can shouldn't be any more than 8.17 inches, since any bigger than that, and it's too hard to hold. That corresponds with a radius of about 1.3 inches, if you use the formula circumference equals 2 pi times the radius. Let's also assume that they found the can shouldn't be any taller than, say, 8.5 inches, because that might make it hard to package or something like that. Using our volume from earlier, that means the radius of the can has to be at least 0.9 inches. 
we now have constraints on what the radius is allowed to be. That radius now has to fall within a closed interval, meaning we're containing both the endpoints. How do we use this new information? Well, the good news is, as long as our function is nice enough, specifically as long as it's continuous on that closed interval, it's guaranteed to reach a maximum and a minimum. The bad news, though, is that it may not happen at a critical point like the minimum in this picture. Instead, it may happen at a boundary point like this maximum. But the maximum and minimum will always happen at either a critical point or a boundary point. In this case, we assume that the radius has to be between 0.9 inches and 1.3 inches inclusive. When we were looking at surface area earlier, we already found that the critical values were r equals 0 and r is about 1.51. But both of these are outside that range, so we know the minimum surface area won't happen at a critical point. It must happen at a boundary point. If we plug in 0.9 inches, we get a surface area of about 53.2 square inches. And if we plug in 1.3 inches for the radius, we get about 43.9 square inches for the surface area. Since 43.9 is the smaller value, that must be our absolute minimum surface area, which leads to a best possible radius of 1.3 inches, the actual standard radius of a soda can in the United States. Think about that the next time you get thirsty. Okay, let's take a moment here to recap what we did to solve our problem. First, we had to make some assumptions about our problem, and we drew a diagram to help us visualize it. Then, we identified the quantities we were interested in, including, most importantly, the thing we wanted to optimize. And we wrote that as a function of the other relevant variables. In this case, though, we ended up having too many variables. So we used other information we knew to whittle it down to a single variable. We then used calculus to optimize our function, solving for where the first derivative was zero or undefined. And then we used the second derivative to check whether we actually had a maximum or a minimum. Finally, once we had an answer, we interpreted it in the context of a problem so we knew what it meant and what to do with it. Now, not every problem will follow this exact same step-by-step -step sequence in order. Some problems just have more or less stuff to take into account, but it should give you a decent idea of what goes into modeling an optimization problem. In fact, if you think about it, this is actually a pretty good blueprint for solving just about any real-world problem using mathematical modeling, making assumptions, drawing a diagram if necessary, figuring out what equation links things together that you care about, uh, doing some calculations, and then seeing what your answer tells you about your problem in the real world. Now, technically, there's one other part we've left out here. See, mathematical modeling is actually a cycle. Once you've answered your question, often many more questions end up coming up. And that leads to refining, or maybe even completely redefining your model in order to see if you can get a better solution to your problem. In some sense, even mathematical modeling itself is really just an optimization problem.